Um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our panel. This is uh, Where Do We Go From Here? Uh, we're talking about the future of Linux desktop today. Uh, we have everybody but Pietro DiCaprio from Vanilla OS. Um, I'm going to go around and introduce everyone. We have Nova King from Start SXR. Uh, that's a XR display server. We have Matthew Miller. You probably already know him from Fedora. Oh, we have Matthew Miller from Fedora right here. Uh, Rosanna Yuen from GNOME. Leighton Gray from Fira Labs. Uh, Drew Adams from KDE and OpenSUSE. And Monica Madden, the community expert. Um, we're going to start today with, uh, we're going to talk about the application ecosystem. So uh, here's the first question. We're going to start with Nova. Um, many of the major improvements, or ugh, many of the major applications coming to the Linux desktop are electron-based ports of existing applications. How might we encourage developers to write native applications and attract them to native platforms? Is this an issue in the first place? Turn on yours on. Mic check. Test, test. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I think this is a legitimate problem. Um, Electron apps, though, can are really, really slow. They take up a lot of space. They're uh, insecure in many ways because Electron is often out of date. Um, and honestly, though, the ports are just never as good as native apps. But it's really hard to make a native app in the first place. So I think really what needs to happen, though, is that distro d designers, um, they need to be flexible about how things look, because oftentimes people will be put off making a native app if it doesn't look exactly perfect. Um, we need more toolkits, and we need, obviously, more money and time and effort put in. And I think that the community needs a bit of a shift, because some communities are leaning more too much towards um, specific design guidelines, um, as opposed to the actual usability of an application. It doesn't matter, you know, if people can, it doesn't matter how good an application looks or how, you know, how well designed it is if people can't use it in the first place. So some leniency and some help and some money would really help in this case. Yeah, um, I think packaging things, uh, this better? A little bit closer, yeah. Okay, yeah. hey, sorry. This way. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, packaging things that are made for Electron is really hard for a distro, and there are all these problems with security and whatever, and there's also kind of a monolithic ecosystem there that's, you know, always a risk. Um, I don't know a great answer. I do think that people are going to want to use web technologies to deliver applications, and I think it's, um, I think we're not going to win trying to fight that. I really would like to see some investment in things like Servo and whatever other alternative engines could exist that would might be more lightweight, faster, and maybe more of a kind of a community maintained thing. Um, it would also be nice if people would take care that their um, web application technology things don't require some particular version of Electron to run well. It really, if you have that, it should run just fine, you know, on Firefox in some way, um, and then having that, like, uh, kind of making that work well for nice people nicely is probably going to be better than fighting the, um, fight, sorry, fighting the, uh, yeah, way people want to develop stuff because people are going to do that. I'll move the mic closer to your mouth. Just keep them one fist. Hello? Does that work? Okay. So I'm not as technical as these two guys, um, but that being said, any app is a good app, right? What we need, we want more users, we want more people using Linux, and part of that is creating more applications that people want to use. Um, so if we can find a way that can somehow have everyone uh, or more people use Linux and apps, it doesn't matter really at the end of the day what they're using. I mean, I understand there are technical issues, obviously, um, but that means like it's just some an another hurdle we have to solve. So. We just have to get there. Yeah, I similarly agree. Um, I'd rather have, you know, electron, electron apps, even though they're buggy, rather than no apps at all, especially. Oh, yeah, sorry. Especially for, like, proprietary software like Discord and such. You're not going to ever see, like, a Linux native app for that. That being said, though, um, what I would like to see is I think there are a lot of um, alternatives to Electron that I think a lot of developers that are already using Electron would probably be interested in if they were better support on Linux. Like, for example, um, 
Microsoft has been putting a lot of work into um, React Native for desktop, right? And that currently has support on Mac OS and Windows, but not really on Linux. And I could genuinely see a lot of people using something like React Native for desktop um, on Linux, you know, especially because it can run on Mac OS and Windows, because it does offer a similar developer experience to Electron, while also providing um, just, it just works a lot better and because it's, in the end of the day, it, rater, it renders using native UI widgets. So I feel like more investment in other, invest in Electron, but also invest in some other, you know, cross-platform UI toolkits and such. Yeah, I'd, I don't have a lot to uh, add to all of those points. I think definitely we need more um, investment in, 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 invest in tools that uh, help us support the way people want to work. They already have skill sets that that's why they're using Electron is because they have a set of skills that they want to apply to the, this problem domain, and that's the thing that gets them there faster. So having tools that support a similar uh, style of work, but gives them more native uh, output would be better. Um, I personally hate Electron apps, but I would much prefer an Electron app than no app at all. I just can only run two or three of them at a time. <laughs> That's how they work. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's it's a combination of all these points, and um, I don't think we can fight the 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 momentum. We have to catch that wave and transition it to something that you know build tools into uh, Qt and. Um, uh, you know, in GTK or, or, or whatever that allow for these styles of work. I, I think that's the best path forward. Okay, um, and I know that I'm going to, I don't want to repeat a lot of great points, but I know something that in the, in the Ubuntu community that worked when I was there was uh, when they made the switch to the Flutter installer, was that this was kind of a small app that could be that was open to the community, especially to the flavors. And this could be kind of a really great point of entry. And so again, I think this goes to an uh, issue a lot of our projects have of give people good starting points to develop apps, give them good documentation. So for whatever tools that you're going to use and then just give them like good projects like, hey, we need this installer or we need like these w w w these w w w widgets and just give them good sign points on good signposts on what your distro needs and that's that and that's also incredibly helpful um, now we're going to do a segment where if you have a response to another panelist you can make that response now otherwise we can move on to the next topic all right. Uh, yeah. So I've got several responses. So uh, I think it was you or you who mentioned um, needing to have Electron apps, though. And I really do understand, though, that it's incredibly popular and um, it's really easy to develop for. But oftentimes, though, a broken Linux app can sometimes even be worse than an app not made for Linux. It can tarnish the reputation. It can confuse people and it can just be in more insecure though um, without letting the user know. So, but also, on the other hand though, having more apps is generally better. It gets more people to develop apps. It improves the quality of the apps. It, it, so it's a very difficult balancing act though. But I have to 100% agree. If we make more starting points for apps though, then more people can fail faster and they can build more apps to make more tools to build more apps, et cetera. And it's a, it's a positive feedback loop. So it's difficult all around though. I think that stuff like Flatpak really helps because it removes dependency issues. It's not a perfect solution, nothing is, but it's getting better over time. The UX from 2008 to now is, is it's, it's massive though. You can actually put somebody who doesn't know Linux in front of a Linux machine. 
Um, did you have a response, Matthew? Or yeah. um, okay. we're going to be moving on. To, uh, let's send it back to Nova, or does someone else have a response? No, send it back to Nova, and we're going to move on to the next topic now. Um, our next topic is sustainability and funding. The question is, what issues do we face when it comes to the sustainability and mental health of contributors? What could we do to address the current faults in the development model, such as maintainer burnout? <sighs> yeah, so one of the most difficult parts about burnout, especially, and I have personal experience with this, Burnout often comes from when you put a ton of effort into something and you don't see many emotional returns though. It feels like you are basically, you know, constantly running up, um, running up the engine and going nowhere. It's a literal tiger burnout. Um, and this can often come from a community that isn't really well engaged though, or something that is highly abstract and needs to be explained in simpler terms, or something that needs to be more accessible to everybody. I think that more resources to actually help the Linux desktop app creators and, and the actual people who develop Linux to get the more social and community side of things under control and uh, to get it out there, as well as different avenues to share projects that might be in an early development stage but have potential. I think those would help drastically though. Even one positive comment can stave off burnout. It, you have no idea just how much it means to say, for somebody to say, wow, that looks cool. So, yeah. Um, there's a lot in the question. Can you repeat it? Can you just like, yeah. um. The question was, what issues do we face when it comes to sustainability and mental health of contributors? What could we do to address the current faults in the development model, such as maintainer burnout? Well, yeah, it's a really big topic. Um, I. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm trying to avoid the plosives and make it loud at the same time. I don't know how to get it. Um, I think really there's a lot about recognizing what people bring to projects and making sure that they feel recognized and supported when people show up to do things. And there's a lot, it's easy to take people for granted, uh, especially when they're doing things so well. And you're like, okay, now I've got this one person who does this thing. We've had this pattern happen to us too many times in the Fedora project where we've got, you know, the docs team's working really well and then the docs team lead is, you know, doing all this amazing stuff and you just kind of, it, it's easy, there are so many things that need attention that when something is working well, it's easy to take for granted. Oh, wow, yeah, that just goes like clockwork. And then at, at some point where you're not paying attention, that goes into, oh, yeah, that person is feeling like they're off on their own and doing this all by themselves. Nobody appreciates them. So making sure we, w you know, in all of our projects, look at what people are doing and recognizing the people who are doing those little things and the big things across the project, I think, can help. Um, some of the greater sustainability things are really hard. Um, I think, yeah, funding and funding for some of the sustaining work that's less fun is it's hard to get, especially because, you know, uh, Linux on the desktop, uh, desktop operating systems are not themselves money makers, so it's hard to attract that kind of funding. But um, yeah, I was talking over at the Thunderbird booth earlier, and, um, and like, wow, were they able to bring in a lot of money just by making a nice little request there? And I think the thing that um, the Flat Hub people are working on about you know, donations to developers and, and you, you know, even paid apps there is an interesting thing. I'm interested to see how that goes. I would also like to see like some of that be taken to. Um, towards sustainability intentionally, both in terms of community sustainability and just making sure the dependencies get funded as well, because when you make those top level asks and that money goes to the people making the flashy applications, all of those flashy applications stand on the shoulders of thousands of other projects. Everybody's seen the XKCD. And so it would be nice if some of the higher level hubs and things that are looking at taking money would um, find ways to pass that on as well. So as someone who works for a nonprofit, I'd like, I mean, we've already established that funding is important, but I also want to point out that burnout isn't just a maintainer or a developer thing. All volunteers burn out. Um, and I've been part of this community for way too many years. I don't want to count. Um, but I mean, I know all y'all, so <laughs> uh, it's, I've seen people burn out and it's, really, really hard to get people motivated and stay around 
Uh, part of it is we need to just keep getting more volunteers because people leave for a variety of reasons. Some of it is burnout, but some of it, you know, they have better life things, which happens, which is good for them, great for them, happy for them, sad for us. Um, so we need to keep getting more volunteers, uh, keep getting more people contributing in all sorts of different ways. Um, and obviously money helps a lot. Uh, if we can fund some of these people who are helping out, then maybe they'll stay longer. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, so, honestly, it's just, I don't even know where to, <coughs> yeah. I don't even know where to start here. Um, I think I see burnout most in sort of, um, like sort of what Matthew said, in the dependencies of projects, right? Like I've seen, I'm, I'm not gonna name any projects specifically, but I've seen, for example, just looking through the GNOME stack, there are a lot of like, you know, a lot of large crucial like C libraries that are basically maintained by the same person. Like we're talking about like 40 by the same person. Um, and you know, when you're sort of, um, when nobody, how do I say, when there's not really attention brought to like these crucial, but you know, not really flashy components, right? What happens is that um, you end up with like one person, you know, doing uh, the brunt of that work and they've sort of put themselves in that way because nobody else wants to step up. And I think um, a large way we can address this is just sort of showcasing more of those core components rather than, you know, the flashy, you know, what the user immediately sees in terms of contribution at least. I think with burnout, um, a big issue is sort of of our own making. Um, when you get excited about something, you sort of want to run with it as fast as you can. And I know for me, it's sometimes really hard to rein that back and say, okay, nope, nope. That, that will lead to burnout, and I encourage other volunteers that I work with, don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to yourself. Harness that excitement, but pace yourself. That's going to be super important to give you the legs for the long term. And in the long term, don't look to do it in silence or in a silo. Look for your deputies, your helpers. Um, and uh, have friendly invites. Always invite people to have fun with you. I, you know, I'm in the uh, Open SUSE project where we say all the time, have a lot of fun. And if you kind of think about what you're doing, if you're excited, you're having fun doing something in open source. Harness that fun and bring someone along for the ride. Let's have fun together. It's more interesting that way. Um, uh, so don't do it in, in a silo. Don't do it in silence. Um, and don't try to bite off more than you can chew. Pace yourself. Um, and and over that long duration, uh, bring people in. As far as uh, financing of it all and, and how to direct that, I think there's interesting things we can do um, that haven't been explored in business models around open source. Um, and I, I hope we'll see more uh, innovation in that space over time, um, but yeah. And this is going off um, a previous con uh, a previous comment, but besides giving people good, well documented on ramps to the project, I think that giving long term contributors temporary off ramps, it's like okay, you had a kid, you had got a huge new responsibility at your paying job, you have a health crisis and having if you have something in place for your project where you're starting to put that knowledge and skill into processes so it's not just that person and when they leave everything good goes with them and it's like okay we've got this we you've you know you've documented your work or we've sat you down for a brain dump and we've documented your work you go take care of this, whether it takes you weeks or months or years, and come back whenever you want. And then that process can guide the next maybe one or two people who step in to take that person's place. And also, um, I think trying to set up formal or even informal mentorship programs 
in your projects. And so that way, those people, before they burn out, have someone they can talk to, even as they are starting to bring in the people who will become them in the next five to 10 years. Now is the time that if anyone has any responses to a previous question or a previous um, answer, you can respond now. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add, um, you said something about mentorships, and this is something I've just recently uh, brought up with um, some of people in GNOME, and we haven't actually done any of this yet, but we're thinking about it. It's not just like mentorships and how to onboard people. Um, we're trying to think of a way to teach people how to be a mentor and how to onboard people. That's something that like we haven't obviously like I really want to think more on and s maybe try and find some way to do that. Let's talk more about that. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I I want to build on what people are saying ab uh, about burnout and um, I guess burnout is something that happens when you have passion. If you have a, like a day job that you go to and this is like you know I'm building some widgets from nine to five or I'm working at you know this office and then I then what I care about, you know, I, it's my hobbies in the evening and whatever. Like, you're not going to get burned out at that job. You might get tired of it or bored or whatever, but burnout's not what, what you'll experience. But I think everybody here has passion for community and software built by community, open source and free software. Like, there's something that really drives us, and it, 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 it is this passion and love. And that you know, has the flip side of putting you at risk for burnout. Um, and uh, one of the situations is that can really happen, kind of all talking about, is when, when you end up feeling like I'm the only one who can do this. Or if I stop doing this, it's all going to fall apart. Um, and so I think that kind of goes to the themes of mentorship and support and inviting other people in and kind of setting up projects to make sure they're structured so that people don't feel alone and feel they can step back and that it's going to be okay if I'm gone for the weekend, if I'm gone for a month, if I'm gone for you know, five years, will I? raise a little baby like it's that should all be okay and you should know that like it's going to keep going it doesn't all just depend on just you i think that really helps buffer against at least one really big source of burnout yeah i definitely have that problem um <laughs> <laughs> i mean so uh, the project i'm working on is stardust xr it's a three-dimensional user interface for the new AR and VR headsets that are coming out, right? And for Linux, that was the demo. Uh, n sort of, yeah. Um, it, the demo failed, but <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> um, but but the thing is, though, is that in my case, there really aren't any other projects like mine. Um, you know, and I don't just want it to be my project, but uh, a lot of the other uh, XR desktops, as they as they're called, have kind of just. You know, they've fallen, they've been archived, they have haven't been updated in years. And it, um, you know, and so sometimes it does actually feel like, you know, you're one of the few people that are working on this project. Um, and you know what would really help with that? Support services. Because right now, though, if you have a problem in open source, like, you know, you know, some company is basically uh, saying, hey, would you like to change your license and we'll donate money to you? I mean, who do you call in that scenario? There's no hotline for it. So, y you know, having support services, having nonprofits that teach you, you know, or just have people that are there to at least talk to that have experience with these really tough problems, that, that would help immensely, though, because there are so many times where I've been in situations where, you know, I just don't have the experience though, and I don't have time to get the experience because it's something that might be more immediate, and I just don't know what to do. So I basically have to like have an anxiety attack though, and then blast out the question to everyone I know, and eventually somebody will help me find an answer, but it's highly inefficient and it accelerates burnout like you wouldn't believe. So I'm having really support sorry to services. cut you off, but we do have to move on to the next question. We're running a long time right. on this one. Um, the next question is going to be really great for some of our non-technical people. Um, Non-code contributions are often neglected. How can we better encourage these contributions, these kinds of contributions, it's like translation, um, design, non-code contributions? Um, yeah, so this is a particularly difficult one for me. 
um, because I do a lot of code. And actually, I did code in order to do design because I'm a UX designer. Um, and the tools that, that were available were simply not good enough to do the UX design. So I had to learn deeper programming than I already knew in order to do that design. Um, in my opinion, what would really, really help is um, we have design sort of isolated in little corners. We have, you know, discussions about design, though, that are in their own little walled off silo and such, though. And, you know, we have design teams that are in their own individual channels, but they're surrounded by a sea of developers. And, you know, if you're a designer uh, and you want to, you know, be able to talk to teams that are very different from yourself, it's particularly difficult. In a lot of projects, though, that are filled with developers, though, when I'm, you know, putting on my designer hat, I mean, who do I, who do I talk to, though? Because I may not know all of the intricacies of the code, and they not may, may not know the intricacies of the design. So getting the two to talk together is particularly difficult. So I, I don't really know, to be honest, but I figured I'd express, you know, some problems I've had. Yeah. Um, uh I could talk about this for like five hours, um, but I'll try not to. Uh, this is an incredibly important topic, and it's a weird thing at companies because, uh, like, I work for Red Hat, which has 20-something you know, thousand employees, and of those, there are maybe like 5,000, 5, 6,000 in engineering, and in engineering, like, what, probably half of those people are actually, like, you engineer technical jobs. So that's, like, what, a tenth of the company is the developers, but yet the company understands that that other, right, like, those other people are actually important. Um, and in open source projects, and especially when companies invest in open source projects, we tend to think, oh, yeah, we've got to invest in this development part, and it, it neglects that other you know, the 90% that you actually need to make an organization run. And open source projects, you know, they're not like a company in every way, but those things you need around, you know, design, documentation, people support, um, and, uh, you know, events and planning and just project management and all, like, you just keep going on and on. Even, you know, even though we don't sell things, those kind of sales outreach kind of things are important in, in all of our projects, and we really have undervalued those. I think we're starting to get better at it, but it's something that needs more and more, and I don't know. Uh, it's interesting, like, uh, in from the non nonprofit perspective, a lot of people that come and volunteer in the GNOME project start off in one of the non-technical roles. They come in, they say, oh, we don't know enough about the code, how can we help you? And then once they get into the community, they help out, and then they learn the code, and then they move on to other parts. Um, so we haven't been able to retain a lot of the people that come in in these non-technical roles because they're not really non-technical people. They just start off there because it's a good foothold for them. Um, it's an interesting question how to interest people that are non-technical to volunteer. Like we've tried, um, I remember a few years back, we tried to do a, a workshop trying to invite lots of you know, college um, PR folks to come and help us, right? And we would help them and, and they it didn't really work. Uh, we didn't know what we're doing well enough apparently. Um, but I would, this is a problem I would love to learn how to solve, <laughs> so. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, in my own personal observations, I'm I'm not a I don't do non-technical things. I'm mostly on the code side of things, and you know, other things like that. Um, but I've sort of noticed um, when I do look at the um, non-technical side of things, is I see sort of it's difficult for newcomers to on ramp, even with the amount of effort that you know has been put into that recently. Um, I s you know I still see like a lot of hurdles and. It's not like um, from the technical perspective where, oh, you have like a Git repository of a bunch of source code, anybody can just, you know, take a look. Um, Non-technical um, contributions are generally um, require much more context, which means you have a more complex like on-ramp process to being able to do that. Um, I also noticed similarly to what uh, Nova pointed out that a lot of the non-technical communities, like especially when it comes to design, are pretty insular within each of the projects, right? Um, at least I, I'm not in GNOME or KDE design. I 
don't do design, but I've noticed that like from a design perspective, there's I see a lot less collaboration there compared to when it comes to code and other technical aspects. So I think those main two things, um, reducing sort of the insularity of the non-technical you know, portions of the community as well as um, finding, I don't know what the solution is for the on-ramp section, but figuring out some sort of way that we can provide that context better so that people can get started. I love getting people involved with open source who are not uh, technical, who maybe wouldn't have ever imagined that uh, open source would be the place they would be participating in some way. But I would argue that almost every single person in the world uh, wants to feel fulfilled by the things they do. And we have a space for all of them to contribute. We have a space where they can let their, um, their interests drive their skill development um, and go far beyond what they uh, currently have ever imagined their, their uh, skill sets to, to be even. Um, because that, can, that entry point can lead to other sorts of contributions. Um, and I think we just need to invite people differently. I think we need to build tools that lower the barrier of entry, that uh, increase transparency in our projects, and allow people without technical skills to find that this project needs a lawyer to review their contracts or whatever, or um, s give support to the developer um, uh, getting an offer like that to change their license. Um, it, it would be, uh, but a lot of people are, have a perception of open source that it is simply, uh, oh, I'm not a developer. I, I can't contribute. And that is just not the case. And it's the story we, we tell that makes that perception and the way we invite to participate. And so we have to change the way we present ourselves in multiple ways. Build tools that, low that lower that barrier of entry, that increase the transparency of our projects. The way we talk about it invite and, and invite to it is friendly and inviting and encouraging and tell people it's okay to not know, that's why you're here. Um, and uh, I think almost everyone will be like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Um, and use their current skills uh, and apply them and develop new skills along the way. But uh, we haven't done a good job at changing any of those things and it's getting harder as like Discord and Slack, and uh, we're, we're getting more fractured in our forms and, and siloed in our forms of communication, and it's getting harder to manage, um, and it's so complex that we're, we're not doing a good job reining it in because it is a big problem. Okay. Oh my gosh, agree with so much of what Drew said. Uh, one of the things that I think as community leaders of projects, that one of the things, and I know Heather Ellsworth is here s s somewhere, yay! Uh, one of the things we did together at Canonical and that we're doing together now at Thunderbird is community office hours, where we highlight community contributors and we look specifically for non-developers and because we realize that those people are so important. And I think that even the way that we sometimes talk about it, instead of just having kind of non-code saying we need design contributors, we need legal contributors, we need accounting contributors. Oh my gosh, it's like someone asked about that and it's like, yeah, having people who know how to handle money is really helpful for projects. And so spotlight them and give and having these video interviews that we've done where we can ask them about, you know, ask them about what they do. And I think 
as importantly, ask them, what's their story? Because if people can watch those or read those and say their story, that could be mine. And you give people that, that narrative that open source isn't something that's scary, that it's something that can be for everybody and should be for everybody. So just the power of story, I think especially for this, is really important. I think, oh. Matthew, you can, you can go first and then. Uh, yeah. um, one of the things, like, uh, Drew, what you're saying about you, you the on-ramps we give people, I think, uh, like, uh, for a specific example, if your project, you get to your project, like, how to get involved has make your first code contribution as the first thing you hit, which is very common. Like, everybody else is like, oh, this is not for me right away. You're filtering people right out. So that's something that you can any, maybe look at if that's something you're concerned about in your project. In Fedora, I think we've done a pretty good job with a come hang out with us. Here's our, like, come come to our release parties uh, and instead of a, like, your fir the first thing to do is to, you know, make friends and, and, s uh, and hang out with us rather than try and find what technical thing you can do first. I think that's, that's something we're working on. I think some of the other on-ramp things are hard. Uh, and yeah, uh, Monica, what you're saying about um, the negative expression of this, I got, a as one does, I got called out on Mastodon about this. Uh, you know, I said, said, said non-code contributors and people are like, why are you making this a negative? Like, it, it's a, I think it's partly because it's this weird problem we've made for ourselves where it, everywhere else in the world, that's just everything. Like that's just people. And we now have focused so much on this, you know, coding developer engineering thing, um, to you know where there's there's been in the past a like you're not really part of the project unless you've contributed code, and we're, we've gotten better about that, but we still don't really even have the language. And I don't have an answer, but if anybody's got something that's non-negative, we can use uh, other than listing each thing, which ends up being a list of 500 things, which is also not um, possible. I don't know. Um, so just responding to that point, uh, generally I just call them contributors. I don't really necessarily make a big distinction out of it though. And um, so Stardust is mostly centered around a Discord server. I'm trying to change that, but a lot of the community building is much more difficult than other places because people don't go to forums much anymore, um, as much as it would be very nice if they did. Um, um, and so to that end, there's a contributor role. And whenever somebody helps out though, in any way, they're a contributor and everybody can see that because their name is, is purple and such though. And um, one of the biggest on-ramps in Stardust is when you, when you join the matrix, uh, the matrix space or the Discord server, there are a bunch of channels that you can just hang out in. There's the aesthetics channel where you can literally just dump like, ooh, I think this will look really, really cool though, right? And you can sort of just, you can contribute in a very, very small, tiny way just by saying, I like this idea. And even if it doesn't get in though, just having a discussion about it is very helpful though. You know, there's concepts though. If you have a more fleshed out idea, you can put it there though. You know, and it's just, it's wide open though. There's management marketing money channel, which is very nice though. Um, you know, if you're, if you're inclined for that though, and it's all incredibly transparent though, you know, if you're having a hard time doing a particular thing, um, the entire atmosphere is very suited towards, you can say it and people will understand and, and be understanding. Um, I feel like a lot of the contributors that contribute to your project reflect how your community is structured. So if you make a community though, that doesn't just feel like a, a group of developers, you're more likely to get people who aren't just developers. So it's, it's a feedback loop for better and for worse. All right, we're running a little bit low on time. So this, we're gonna do one more normal length question and then um, we're gonna do a f a one a little bit faster. So um, this, this question is about community. Uh, casual toxicity can be common in some Linux spaces, even when we ultimately want the same goal. How may we better address this behavior? Oh, toxicity. Would you like me to repeat the whole right. question? Or? Right. So I'm particularly lucky that uh, Stardust hasn't really had to deal with that much. However, the limited times it has had to deal with it, most of the time it's you talk to the people who are most affected by that toxicity, though, whoever is being hurt by it though, 
and then you decide, is it really worth it? And 99% of the time, no, it, it absolutely so isn't. Sometimes people are misunderstood, but you still have to take them out of the conversation, though, so they don't spread toxicity and you can, you know, you can talk with them, you know, to the side. But, um, yeah, overall, though, it just depends on the situation, but cut it off before it spreads is, I think, my biggest recommendation. <laughs> this is another one that I could talk about for a long time. Uh, I'll try to be quick. Uh, I think a lot of it is a matter of setting expectations and norms in your community, and when you see things that are not okay, talk to people about it. Um, I also think, I, I really believe that people can grow and learn, and most people have that capacity, and uh, at the same time, you have to look at impact first, and it's we're, it's not our job to to help to teach everybody how to be a better person. As much as it would be great if we could do that, uh, so th it, it's it's always a hard hard balance to do this right. And to, you know, we want people to be able to make mistakes, and we don't wanna, I don't want to kick someone out just because they are having a bad day. Uh, you want to be able to understanding of people, but people have to realize that when they're having a bad day, how they act on that day, you know, really affects other people and can have cascading effects. Um, it's just a lot of work. Speaking of things that lead to burnout, um, I'm going to now pass the mic off. Yeah, I did a t like a one hour talk on this about a few months ago. So, um, yeah, I mentioned earlier I've been in this project for many, many years. Um, and so me and pretty much everyone else in this room has survivor bias, right? We all think we could handle whatever it is that we see and whatever toxicity we've been trying to stamp out because we're all good people, um, I hope. <laughs> uh, so so uh, yeah, like it's important to, to listen to the new people that come in, right? If they say that there's something, you have to trust them you have to hear them out and see where it is that, because like, I I know I've been super lucky to be part of this community for so many years, and like, I know the people who've protected me, and I know why I'm still here, um, and I try and do that for other people. But part of the bias is that like I don't see everything, and I know I don't see everything. So make sure we got to make sure that we keep our ears open and let people know, especially newcomers, that they can always speak out and always let us know what's going on, and we will listen. That's the best advice I can give. Yeah, um, mostly agree. But I, on a systemic level, right? I think um, inconsistent enforcement tends to be a, an issue in especially when in large open source projects where you don't really have the team to do right moderation that well right um you sort of get cases where people do end up being toxic and maybe because of their status within the project or you know they've been here for you know let's say 10 years that sort of behavior is allowed to slide and that sort of environment we sort of need to while it's important to re retain contributors, uh, it's, you know, it's important to recognize that, you know, people you know, sometimes have, had, have a bad day and that, you know, we have to recognize what people have done good for a project. We also have to recognize that I think it is overall better for this, for a community to let somebody go that is toxic, even though they've contributed a lot of code, for example, right? And it's not an easy decision to make, but we do have to be much more strict about enforcement. Um, when it comes to an individual level, what um, I would say is just when you see somebody, you know, that is, you know, getting a lot of heat or just, you know, um, I guess is a victim of some sort of toxicity, I would just message them, honestly. Just see how they're doing. Just check in. And honestly, that does all, it helps a lot, um, I would say when I have, you know, received toxicity in the past myself. Um, so those are <laughs> I, that's all I have to say for now. Otherwise, I'd probably be going on for hours. <laughs> so. I think the first thing we have to combat this is going back to that point I made earlier about um, the sort of narrative around inviting people. Um, 
the way you present your project, the way you present uh, it, your your ask for help, and the people you attract with it, um, is going to shape your project. Um, the tone you set, others will follow. Um, and uh, I think that there is a a first position I take on meeting anyone is you're good. You want good things for you and for me. Um, it may not be true, but it's where I have to start. Um, because I don't think I would be uh, right to assume otherwise. So, but that doesn't mean I have to let you plow over me or plow over someone else. And if I see something that I think is toxic or just generally, mm, that seems a little weird, um, I might just need to have a conversation with that person, but it's a conversation about understanding. It's about understanding that person, what they mean uh, and where they are um, sort of like emotionally and uh, what they, where they're, maybe belief is on what they just uh, did or said or, or whatever. Um, and I think that that's uh, an important thing is you get a little bit of grace, but you can't abuse it and you have to learn and grow. Um, and uh, we can't as a, I, I really think we can't just let things like that slide. It needs to be someone has to moderate it. Someone has to, to actually step in and do that. And it's like, no one's job, so who does it? Um, you know, is it the maintainer? Is it the, you know, and you are, if you succeed in having a divi diverse group, you have a div diverse set of communication skills, uh, language barriers, um, cultural differences, perhaps, um, um, you know, uh, just perspectives on the world. So it becomes a hard thing to, to moderate, and there isn't an easy answer. If there was a silver bullet, it would have been used by now. Yeah, and I agree with many of the points here that when these incidents come up, the first step is a conversation with that person. And I think this is when having codes of conduct that are clear that saying like, okay, we these are the behaviors we do not, that are not a part of who our community is. And just be explicit. Because I know it's easy to have kind of vague ones that are just like, be nice. And it's like, okay, that really doesn't help. Um, and so it's like, okay, hey, this is who we are. This is how we are going to be in community with each other. And if something happens and you have a bad day and you hurt someone, we're gonna talk with, with you and say, hey, what's go going on? And then, but also have a series of kind of steps. And if that person, if that bad day turns starts turning into bad week, month, it's like have clear steps. It's like, okay, if this behavior persists, you know, knowingly, then, there are documented steps that we're going to follow. And so it becomes process and not personal. And have, again, that grace that if this person can grow and become that better person, that good person we want them to be, it's like, okay, you can come back. But if you're in a stage where you're actively harming the others you're supposed to be in community with, we are taking the health of that community foremost. And I think having just clear guidelines on that is really help helpful. Um, we're not gonna do any responses for this question because we're running low on time. So the next one we're gonna do pretty quickly. Um, I just wanna hear like maybe 30 seconds of an idea. Um, what areas or features should we be prioritizing for standardization? Like we recently standardized accent colors and we're working on high contrast. Um, what features can we work to standardize? And I just like to hear like a couple minutes or a couple of seconds of questions. Right, so um, I want to add though that, you know, all of us are coming from different projects with different sizes though. So smaller projects though often will use more standards than they'll make, but as they get bigger, they'll create more standards. In the case of Stardust though, which is for AR and VR, 
it would really help if every single compositor would accept um, the agreed upon standard for VR headsets, for example. It would also help um, if we standardized things like uh, we added to standards, like for example, added 3D icons for different applications and such. It's not the most important, but it's incredibly important for the project I'm doing. Um, okay, keep things quick. Uh, eBPF programs, who gets to load them? What's the policy? Can my game change how the kernel behaves? Let's find out. Uh, we don't know. Uh. I'm gonna pass the mic. <laughs> gonna keep this quick? Accessibility. I just think we have to listen to to people using the software um, and understand uh, where they're coming from and the challenges of the people actually using the stuff and uh, make the decision from there. To, to have a response without listening, uh, I, 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 I don't think it would be very informed, so. Um, I'm going to have a plus one to the ex uh, to the ex accessibility comment. And was that a timer? Okay. All right. Uh, and things like, especially um, considering the needs of, and that's accessibility for things like screen readers, but that's also things like cognitive accessibility. And so just consider, and also, um, the ways that we can work together on those standards. How can we do these things in cooperation with each other so we're not having a duplicate effort that is, that let's admit it, we don't have that much time and we don't have that, that much time. And so let's kind of, when we can work together on these standards, let's try to do so to the maximum extent that we can. All right, um, now we're gonna wrap this up in a pretty little bow, this very difficult discussion. How can we work together to solve the problems we discussed today? Um, a big part of the world changing over the past 20 years, just like the Linux space, has been globalization and more interconnectedness. How can we keep working together as a team to solve problems that affect the whole ecosystem? Let's do one sentence for this. Um, just keep on improving, keep on adapting. I think conferences like scale are really important. Bringing people together like this, it, we have it cross community connections that don't happen otherwise. Let's make sure we keep doing these kind of things. Also, thank you very much for moderating this and putting this together. This, is, this has been great questions that we could have obviously talked for five hours on. Yeah, um, conversations, keep ha all those conversations going. And like, I would love to keep talking with all y'all um, about all these topics and even more, so it'd be. In short, just conversations like these, acro especially across communities and desktops. Yeah, cross community collaboration and uh, working together on the problems of like openness and transparency in open source projects, I think would be, uh, would go miles. Reach out to a, a reach out to a project that um, is, may is maybe related to yours and if there's a line of communication that isn't open yet, be the one to open it. Um, I'd like to thank everyone on the panel for coming today. Um, we really appreciate you coming out. I, I think some of you were already here, but I really do appreciate everyone coming on today. Um, thank you for every, to everyone for coming in and uh, listening to us. Um, We really appreciate it, and we need everyone's feedback to keep moving as an ecosystem. Uh, panelists, if you guys could stay for like two minutes in the hallway while we pack up, we want to chat for a moment before everyone does, uh, leaves. And we're going to let it go for the next talk. Uh, anyone know what it is? Thunderbird. Yeah. Woo, Thunderbird. Yeah. Uh, thank you.